I see somebody and he starts speaking in tongues. And I was like, dude, this just got weird. Because like, you came from a Baptist church. Right? Yeah, I, I never experienced that at any church, period. For anybody who wants to, to receive the gift, raise your hand. I was just far in the back and I was feeling it and I was praying and I was just like, I'll raise my hand. It felt like from the top of my head, somebody had like poured oil and it just like went over my whole body. Are you serious? Yeah. One of my buddies, he actually works for me. He's worked for me for six years. Strong believer, his name's mm -hmm. Michael. He actually got saved in prison. He goes, dude, I was so resistant and dude, I was like about to walk out and leave, but I felt like God was something like this force was pushing me to the ground to bow down but there was nobody pushing me jesus so i was seeking like all this help to try and figure out what was happening to me because i could feel things were happening like at a very different level than ever before you were hungry yeah i was like i need to understand what's happening right now since you were baptized in the holy spirit that there's been a direct correlation to some of the success in your business particularly with speaking in tongues and praying in tongues well here's the funny thing financially since all that happened it was actually the worst time of my life. I think that those things were gonna happen whether I was baptized or not. Oh, right? come on now. Because those, those things were already in play. Yeah. I just felt like the spirit leading me. Like a lot of times I don't know why I ended up doing things and then it's not revealed until later. But like, I mean, that was one thing. I've talked a lot about all the transgender stuff. I've talked about men and women's roles and what they should be. <laughs> like, I don't know. I've talked about pretty much everything you could imagine. I just don't care. Well, bro, if you can't say what you want, are you actually free? Taylor goes, I need you to read this book. It's called, um, it's about David. And he said, and he perceived that he was king. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I, I just wrote it down as one of the many books that whenever I get a recommendation, I just buy it. And whenever I get to it, I get to it. Yep. I didn't read it for a while. And then this was in January, right after that wealth call, which like was very spiritually like heavy. And in a good way or a bad way? In a good way. way. Okay. Yeah, I was like, that was crazy. Like just what was happening. Yeah. We had like 400 people in the room get up during the altar call. You were 400? Yeah, I was, was in my, I was sick in my room. Yeah, dude, for the worship service, we have 400 people. Dude, half the room came what on earth. Hey guys, this is Ryan Pineda, and this is my show, Directed Life, and today we're interviewing Cap Chatfield. I don't think that's what we're doing, but yeah, here we go. No, switching places. I'm in Ryan Pineda's seat. No, we're, I'm, in a, I'm in Ryan Pineda's studio today. He's given me the, the opportunity to interview him, so dude, so grateful to, uh, to talk to you, man. Yeah, no, it's great to, to have you here again, man. I feel like I just keep seeing you in Vegas now. You're, you're like becoming a local. I know. It's pretty cool. Your whole team is phenomenal, and we'll talk about how special your organization is shortly. But uh, first thing I want to ask you is, tell me about when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So I uh, was born in, I was born in the church. I was pretty much born in the church. Like I, I grew up going to church ever since I was a kid, Baptist church. And uh, you know, my testimony's not crazy. You know, I don't have one of those falling away testimonies like some church kids do. You know, I went to Sunday school. I went to church every Sunday. Like. You know, I was pretty devoted. Um, I made a commitment even as like a high school kid. I was like, dude, I'm gonna wait till I'm married to have sex. I'm gonna try and live out for Jesus. And, you thought um, that in high school? Yeah. And, wow. you Props. know, I had this, this idea in my mind cause that was just what I had been told and it's what God had kind of convicted me to do as a young age. Um, and I, I got water baptized when I was 18. Um, you know, when I went off for college, uh, you know, I end up going to college, I get drafted, I play pro baseball. So I have like all of these worldly things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even with that, I, I still stayed uh, pretty pure. I still was following God. Like it, there, there's no like real drama to the story in terms of, uh, you know, getting into drugs, you yeah, know, sleeping you around. like a heathen. <laughs> I mean, dude, I mean, I, I've talked about this on my show. My biggest struggle, my, most of my adult life and teenage life was porn like many mm -hmm. others, because if you know, you're trying to stay pure, 
you know, you're like, well, I'll just go to the the, the lesser sure. of the evils, right? Sure. And so that was always a struggle. But um, overall, like most would think I was pretty good, yeah. right? Uh, ended up getting married at 24. And so to my wife, Mindy, we just celebrated uh, 10 years last year. Good for you. Thank Congrats. you. Um, and so, you know, we, we ended up going to a non-denominational church for 10 years, um, for pretty much the first 10 years of our marriage, because uh, we wanted to pick a new church that we both could go to here in Vegas. And so we did that. And honestly, like I was very smart theologically. You know, I always read my Bible. I understood. I like listening to guys like John MacArthur and, you know, a lot of those guys. And um, it's weird because I was like doing all these things and, and feeling like I, I knew intellectually so much about faith. Yep. But I went to this conference here in Vegas two years ago. It's called the Altar Conference. And so my now friend Derek Carr, uh, quarterback of the Saints. Yeah. He, he was the QB here in Vegas. Yep. And um, he put on this conference like 10,000 men. And it was about men stepping up and leading and everything else. And he so, put on the conference? Yep. What a beast. Yeah. I mean, this dude is, he's the man. Yeah. And um, he had his mentor and his pastor, his name is Maddie Montgomery. Um, him and I. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the Screamo guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know that at the time because I don't listen to Screamo. Yeah. But um, so him and Maddie throw this event called the Altar Conference. And um, at the time, I got to meet Derek and Maddie because I went and played golf with them. I, I sponsored, uh, you know, this course uh, or the thing with them, it, whatever. Long story short, got to know them really well before the event. So then I go to the event and, um, you know, the first two days are really good. Like, you got pastors, you got like amazing worship teams and, you know, all these guys. And I was mm -hmm. like, man, this is like an amazing event. Well, dude, at the end, um, very end of the event, I see somebody and he starts speaking in tongues. And I was like, dude, this just got weird. Because like, you came from a Baptist church. Right? Yeah, I, I never experienced that at any church, period. Right. And I had seen it. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I had seen it like on YouTube and stuff. Like, it's not like I didn't know what was going on. But he but just I, took the mic and just r let it rip. Well, like they kind of prepped for it. And he was just, I don't even remember, honestly, because it just happened so quick. Like I went from like vibing <laughs> to like, whoa, what is going on right now, dude? So oh my gosh. That's he, he starts speaking in tongues and he he asked like but it was weird right because i was first i was at first shock it's like it's even hard for me to articulate it right now i'm usually like really well spoken but i'm like i was so confused at what was happening but i could feel my spirit saying like no like don't don't be don't like use your mind and don't like logically like but wow. you you feel something happening and i was like i do like this is weird but like Mm. It's not. And so then he was like, hey, for anybody who wants to, to receive the gift, like, raise your hand. And, dude, we're in a room of, like, 10,000. This is the Thomas and Mack Stadium, yeah. right? This is not like, you know, walk up to the altar and, you know, people are just going to start falling down and stuff. Like, I was just far in the back, and I was feeling it, and I was praying, and I was just like, I'll raise my hand. Wow. And, dude, I mean, I've been saved for a long time. So, like, yeah. I haven't had to do an altar call or anything, <laughs> you know, in a long time. Yeah. And so somebody just starts praying over me and praying over me. And, like, I'm just feeling this rush of it felt like from the top of my head, somebody had, like, poured oil and it just, like, went over my whole body. Are you serious? Yeah. It was this, this feeling I had never felt before. And I was like, dude. Cause I am not emotional. Like I'm very logical. I'm precise. I'm like a tactician. I was like, what is happening to me right now? Wow. And you know, this just overwhelming feeling comes over me and I just start speaking, but I don't really know what's going on. And I wasn't like convinced that I, it had happened or, or like, I didn't know what happened. Honestly, I, yeah. I left feeling really confused. So that event ends. Um, quick question. Yeah. The oil. Did you, were you able in that moment to say this feels like oil or is that a thought you had after? Like, um, cause that description no. is so biblical. It, it was just like this. It like, it literally felt like my head, like something was on it. I wouldn't have called it oil at the time. Okay. Now I, now I would after hearing that before too, 
but it just felt like it literally went through my body, like very much like water would. Praise God. Yeah, so it was weird. And I was with some of my buddies who were in my Bible study. Like I've been doing Bible studies and stuff for a long time, well mm -hmm. before this. And um, none of us had ever talked or, or spoke or anything like that. We had never experienced spiritual gifts like that. And so afterwards I was like, guys, <laughs> what'd you think of all that? <laughs> like, I'm just like, I don't know what some, what are these guys about to say? <laughs> and so they were like, that was weird. And one of my buddies, he actually works for me. He's worked for me for six years. Strong believer, his name's mm -hmm. Michael. He actually got saved in prison. And wow. he goes, dude, the, that was super, super weird. But he, he goes, here's something even weirder. He's like, I was so resistant and dude, I was like about to walk out and leave. Mm. Um, and he goes, but I felt like God was something like this force was pushing me to the ground to bow down. And he's like, so I was on the ground, like bowed down, but there was nobody pushing me. Jesus. Love it. And he's like, I can't explain it, but he's like, I don't know that I believe what, what just happened over there. Right. And so, <laughs> and even to this day, I think he's still, he's still figuring things out. But anyways, we both had like, we, we all had that experience. So anyways, what happened was I came back home that night or the next day we go to church on Sunday and we're having lunch after, and I'm telling, I'm talking to Mindy and I'm like, babe, um, some weird happened last night at the event. I was like, I don't know how to explain this, but like this guy started speaking in tongues and like, at first it was super awkward and weird, but then like it wasn't. And I had this weird feeling that I cannot explain that happened after. And she was just like, okay. Cause she wasn't raised that way either. Yeah. So we both had never like seen it or anything. And I was like, yeah, I don't really know what to make of it. Cause at this point I'm not gonna go like lead my wife and, and be like, we need to start speaking. And I, I still didn't even know. Yeah. For so sure. I ended up going on this journey and I text all my friends who I knew were strong believers. And I said, question, do you speak in tongues? I'd literally never asked anyone this. And I hate to make this all about tongues, but that was the, the catalyst. And so I, I don't hate it. I love it. Keep going. So I ended up asking about seven of my close friends. And I heard Derek Carr talking about it on stage too. Yeah. And I knew Derek and I'm like, he's not like crazy. And I'm like, so if he's saying this and he's not crazy, then Come on, I asked about four of my friends and they all said it too, four of the seven. And I was like, really? Why, why have you never told me about this? <laughs> like, that was the first thing I asked. I'm like, why, why don't you ever tell me about this? And why, explain to me how this works. Mm -hmm. So I had meetings with all of them. And then I had a, a meeting um, with the pastor at my old church too. And I was like, like, what is your position on this? Cause like, I just, I've never heard you guys talk about it in 10 years. And um, he's like, you know, there are people in the church who do it. There are those who don't. We, we're not like publicly for or against it in either way. Um, but that's just, you know, where we're at. And um, then I ended up meeting with the pastor at City Light, Jaden. And because I, uh, some of my friends who are at this office who work for me go to City Light and they speak in tongues. Because I asked them, I was like, do you speak in tongues? And he's like, yeah. I was like, okay, I know you're not crazy either. So like, explain to me how this works. And so then hmm. I go have a meeting with Jabin and it just so happened, or no, actually I didn't have a meeting with him yet. Pastor Jabin from City Light? Yeah. Yep. What happened was he was like, you should go to City Light and check it out. And so I go um, to a night service. This is my first service because I didn't want to disrupt what we were doing as a family. So we went to, you know, normal Sunday service in the morning. And then I'm like, I'm gonna go personally attend this night service just to see, cause I don't wanna lead my family into some weird thing that, you know, I don't know what's going on. So I go to this night service and Javen gets on stage and him and I have talked before, like we, we knew of each other. Mm -hmm. um, but he's like, hey, I'm gonna scrap what we talked about this morning on Sunday. He's like, I feel like the Lord's calling me to talk about tongues. And I was like, well, I came on the right night, <laughs> you know? And so I brought my friend Blake with me and he preached this whole sermon about the gifts and everything else. And he's like, I'll never do this like on Sunday morning and everything. But he's like, but I'm going to speak in tongues and, you know, kind of walk you guys through Show it. Show you practically what it looks like. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like who would have, 
this is crazy that Come I'm on. walking in the first day on this. And he's like, and we haven't done this for like a year. And, um, you know, sure enough, he starts explaining now the verses and everything. And as a logical guy, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, why would I think this would have stopped? This, like, you know, X, Y, Z, right? So then I start going there at nights and different things to... Oh, well, actually, no, what was happening was my wife was playing on the worship team at the other church. And I'm not making this about this church or that church. I'm just explaining what happened because I still love that church too. Yep. Um, but she played on the worship team. So on the time she was playing, I would go double dip. So I would go to two services. And I just wanted to see what was happening and what was the difference and everything. So then after one of the services, I go to the back with Javen and I'm like, I need you to explain to me like what this all means. And... Um, he had some books for me to read. Um, one was like by John Bevere. One was by um, Robert Morris. And, you know, he just explained it. He's like, you know, there's three baptisms. And I was like, what? I thought there's just one, you know? And then he, you know, he goes to explain like, you know, when you accept Jesus, when you're water baptized, and then when you're baptized by the Spirit. And I'm like, show me where exactly those things show up in the Bible mm -hmm. and everything else. And so, you know, he starts to explain it. And um, at that time too, I called Maddie Montgomery. And um, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, I ended up uh, helping them buy a church because they were expanding. Nice. And so I had an, like a relationship with him already. And I was like, I need you to now explain to me like what this is. So I was seeking like all this help to try and figure out what was happening to me because I could feel things were happening like at a very different level than ever before. What was the time span that this was happening um, from the conference to this mo moment? A couple of months. But every Man. day I was like reading books. I was You were hungry. Yeah, I was like, I need to understand what's happening right now. So I go through this period of a few months and then I start to understand that like, okay, this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And... I start to be able to like trust in what's happening and what I'm doing and how I'm speaking and praying and all of that. And then, um, you know, as time went on, as I got more confidence, I started to explain it to Mindy and I'm like, hey, this is like what it is. Like, I need to explain to you what I've uncovered these last bunch of months going through it. And so then I, we start going over to this church and it's funny because like, it's, it's, a typical like charismatic Pentecostal church where people are talking back and stuff. We're not used to that. Mm -hmm. And she just starts like laughing because she's like, what's going on here? I'm like, just, you know, <laughs> you'll, you'll get used to it. Don't worry. So wow. anyways, it was this whole process of like a year just understanding what had happened to me. But yep. it was, I, I would say it was that day at the conference when it happened when I finally let like my logical side of me go and I was like, I'm gonna embrace what I'm feeling supernaturally. And from that point forward, the last two years, it was like undeniable what has happened fruit wise, you know, mm. from it. I wanna talk about the fruit. Yeah. So you are a prolific entrepreneur. How many companies do you have now? I don't know, probably five or six. Five or six? Yeah, and main ones. multiple of them are doing eight figures or so? Uh, most are doing seven, seven. Uh, some are eight, yeah. Okay. So you're crushing it. God has definitely given you a grace for real estate. And you got now this, this uh, marketing agency you're doing for real estate investors or whatever, giving them leads. You're a content creator. And then you started this thing called Wealthy Kingdom, which is this massive Bible study network where you have how many Bible studies now? Um, I'm over 50 right now. 50 Bible studies. It's a whole network of Bible studies that are geared for kingdom entrepreneurs mostly, yep. right? Yep. Let me ask you, do you feel like since you were baptized in the Holy Spirit that, that there's been a direct correlation to some of the success in your business, particularly with speaking in tongues and praying in tongues? Well, here's the funny thing. I think <laughs> financially, since all that happened, it was actually the worst time of my life. Interesting. So, you know, for right those, after that happened, literally the worst. Wow. Um, and the hardest struggle financially. So like, obviously like I'm fine, but you know, I went from 2020 to 2022, just crushing it, you know, making money hand over fist. And then, um, you know, for those who know in real estate, they, they raised interest rates big time in yep. the middle of 2022. 
So from that point forward to, you know, all the way through 2023 was like rough as a real estate investor for all people in real estate, mm -hmm. right? Not just me, but your, your problems get far bigger when you have more real estate than most. And yep. so, you know, I had 50 or yeah, 50 plus house flips that I had to sell at a loss, you know? And so oh, you lose millions of dollars on deals that were bought good, but then rates rise yeah. and people stop buying and all this crap. And, you know, you sell all these deals and you pay back all the investors and it's got to just come out of your own pocket. Um, so I dealt with that. I dealt with shutting down some businesses that didn't work out, deal with lawsuits, deal with uh, more attacks. So like, Actually, being baptized by the Spirit was... Um, Maybe this doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that was the thing, right? I think that those things were going to happen whether I was baptized or not. Oh, right? come on now. Because those, those things were already Jesus. in play. Yeah. And so for me, wow, interesting. I look at it now, now that I'm out of the storm. Yep. You know, it's basically took two years to get out of the storm financially. And you would have never known that from the outside, right? Because you see the events. You see the social media, like oh, we're wow. still making money, we're still doing things, yeah, but yeah. financially dealing with all these different things, wow. you would never know. And I do believe it's because my faith and everything increased, right? Yeah. And I look back at it now and I'm like, there's no way I should have got through all the different storms that were thrown in my direction, mm -hmm. multiple storms without that happening. I, I think one of my favorite verses, Ryan, is Re Romans eight twenty six. I believe it is, 26 and 27, which talks about how when we know not what to pray, the Holy Spirit within us as believers intercedes with groanings and utterances that can't be understood in mm -hmm. the mind, yet are the perfect will of God. And I, I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where my back's been against the wall, and I just, I go into speed tongues. Like, I'm like, I don't <laughs> even know what to pray in English. But that's like the, it's a mercy gift of God where it's like when you don't even know what to say, what's the formula of the words? What do I even ask for? You, you just flow and yield to the Holy Spirit and he prays the perfect will of God through you. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I would say it's 100% true that you being endowed with that power and operating in that yielding of his spirit is what carried you through. And now it was a season of it was a season of hardship, but it was also a season of sowing. Like you were sowing the right seeds and now you're starting to reap the harvest of those seeds. Yeah, and I would say too, it's funny because um, as I talk to more people who were, um, let's just say Pentecostal, and uh, they're like, oh bro, now the devil's about to really come after you harder. And I was like, bro, I don't receive any of yeah, that, like, right? I don't receive that. <laughs> I don't receive Return that. Return the sender. Yeah, I don't, I'm not taking that. Um, now granted, uh, I did face far more trials and far more hate and far more, you know, persecution than ever before. Tell me about that. Um, well, I just think, like I said, right, I already talked about the financial things. Yeah. Um, when, especially when you're a public figure and you have failure, everybody wants to chirp about it, right? So Sheesh. now you start to face more hate. Um, I think the economy shifting, you know, makes it tougher on people and so more people just act the way they act when times are tougher. Wow. Um, and then, you know, there just started to be this thing as I got more bold in my faith because the spirit was calling me to do that. Mm. Um, you know, people just want to criticize that, right? Why is this guy talking about money and God? Why is, uh, you know, he's trying to use God to make more money, you know, this, oh. this or that, right? So, you know, here's the thing, like, it hasn't phased me at all. Like, I'm just doing what I do regardless of, outside people saying whatever they want to say, but right. whether it was Satan or whether it was God, you know, whether it was God putting me through a test, mm. and, well, either way, everything is allowed by God, right? Sure. So I, I do feel like I went through a season of Job where mm. I just got beat Man. up, left over right, and it's like, well, God, yeah, Satan did do the beating up, but God allowed it. God allowed it. And so regardless of why it happened or everything wow. else, I'm happy it happened because now, you know, I've learned so much and grown from it. Okay, so I want to talk about the, the money and God thing. Oh, it's such a good conversation. I get the same sort of feedback from people, especially like being a minister, a pastor, and a content creator, and an entrepreneur. It's like you, there's these two kingdoms, right? There's the kingdom of 
the sacred, which is church, ministry, and then there's the kingdom of this world, the marketplace. And you can be in one or the other, but if you're starting to blend the two, it's like the separation of church and state. And uh, that, that comment about using God to make money, tell me about that. Like, what, what were you starting to speak up and be vocal about, and then how did that get, get you kicked back? Um, look, I think, like, on my podcast, I just started interviewing more just, you know, pastors like you. Um, you know, I just started talking about faith more. I started praying at my events. Then I started having worship at my events and bringing pastors to my events. And clearly these are secular events. Yeah. Like we're going to sell you something. Sure. You know, this is, this is a business, you know, those events aren't like a nonprofit, you know, with wealthy kingdom. Now it is truly a nonprofit. And so that is like, they're two separate things. But you know, at the end of the day, I run businesses to make money and you know, it, it's just, I don't know. It's funny to me because I made a lot of money well before any of like, I, I don't want to say I didn't need to use God's name to make money. Yep. Like I was already rich, like, but I want to push God's name. Like, and it just so happens I'm going to push it everywhere. Places I make money, <laughs> places I don't make money. He's just going to get pushed everywhere. And so it just is what it is. And criticism is going to come that way. Can I ask you what, so you got to clearly giving you such a grace for business and it's given you this awesome platform. And if I can interpret what you're saying and simplify it, you're seeing like, okay, yeah, this platform is to make his name known, is to communicate with the people that, I, that I've influenced with in this marketplace world in Las Vegas, for crying out loud, about the one thing that matters. So I, I see you as just being a good steward with what God's given you. But I want to ask you, what's, what's been the most controversial thing that you felt led by God to say that cost you anything, cost you business, cost you your reputation? Mm, it's I, hard to know, like, whether there was a cost or not. Yeah. Um, dude, I mean, I've spoken up on lots of issues. You know, I've talked about Israel and Palestine. I was thinking about that, um, one, actually. Yeah, like, I made a video about that, and, you know, a bunch of people were pissed. And it's like, whatever. You know, like, I literally just told the history. I was like, how foolish for all of the Palestine pro people to say like, oh, well, this is our territory. It's like, bro, land has been here from the beginning of time since mm -hmm. God created it. For, like none of us own it, number one. It just keeps switching hands over and over again. You know, number two, like God promised the Israelites land and it just is what it is. I don't know what else to tell you. It's in the Bible. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say he did it. You know, like he said he did it. Yep. And so... They had the land, you. you guys had the land, they got the land back, you guys got the land back. It just keeps switching hands over and over again. But, you know, like the point I made was this has been happening for thousands of years. This is not some Zionist thing that uh, you think like, oh, well, they took it back in 1950 uh, or whatever they said. And I'm like, 1948. Yeah, I'm like, dude, so you think that this is the first time they took the land in 1948. That's what you think. It's ignorance. So anyways, like I, I'll talk about things like that. Um, now it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't disqualify. Like I don't want to see people killed. I don't want to see kids killed. I don't want to see all this fighting and things that happen from it. For sure. But the idea that this land is stolen is stupid. So why did you feel compelled to speak up on that? Um, dude, I don't know. I just felt like the spirit leading me. Like a lot of times I don't know why I ended up doing things and then it's not revealed until later. Um, but like, I mean, that was one thing. I've talked a lot about uh, all the transgender stuff. I've talked about men and women's roles and what they should be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've talked about, <laughs> like, I don't know. I've talked about pretty much everything you could imagine. I just don't care. I, dude, I, I just respect it. <laughs> I respect it because, you know, we just finished recording your podcast. We talked about some of those similar topics. And I don't think it's cost me anything, though. When you ask what did it cost you? Yeah. I was like, I don't think it. I don't think it's cost me anything. I think it, it gave you a net positive ROI, but it definitely, <laughs> in the moment, because I, I saw that video you put out and I, yeah. I liked it. I, <laughs> I liked loved, it. I, I thought it was great, but um, I saw some of the comments that people were saying, and you know, I love I love how you 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 referenced too. You like your your uh, baseball career, how you learned how to, you know, baseball is a game of 
perfection. You got to get really comfortable like failing all the time. You got to get comfortable people with people, you know, rejecting you and saying all the things they want to say about you, especially in business, right? Yep. In business like in sales, you got to be comfortable people saying no all the time. And so you've God definitely prepared you for that some of that flack, but but I guess the question the reason why I'm curious is because I shared with you my story. I had this this uh this warped view of like as I was building my business, if I really went all in with what I really believe, and I really let my light shine, I'm gonna compromise the whole thing that God gave me. It's just weird, I don't, know if, I don't know if you felt that way ever, but for me it was like this thing of like, God gave me this business and I better not screw it up. So if I start saying things that the Bible says, I'm gonna lose favor with the world, and then the whole thing falls apart. Did you ever but deal here, with that? Here's the thing I've realized is like, the reason I even became an entrepreneur is because I don't want to listen to anybody. Like, no, for real, I'm like, I don't need to be told what I can and can't say, what time I got to come to the work. Like, I'm, I'm not. I've that's, always been that that's way. Fair. That's and fair. And so, no, what's interesting is a lot of, okay, so the reason you get into business for a lot of people is like, they want to be financially free, right? Yeah. But freedom is actually, financial, finance is just one aspect of freedom, right? Go so there. there's time freedom, right? Because yep. if you have all the money, but you got to be at work 80 hours a week, you don't have freedom. Golden handcuffs. Right? Uh, there is the freedom of speech, like we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, bro, if you can't say what you want, are you actually free? Man. And so, you know, there's lots of freedoms, and we get freedom in Christ, right? Yep. And so at the end of the day, like, I did another post where I talked about um, what, it, what happened recently. Like, uh, there was... Some transgender day, was it wasn't on Easter or something? I can't even remember. Oh, that. yeah, day of transgender visibility. Yeah. Big, and, big Joe. Yeah, and it was on Easter, right? So I just big made Joe. a post about it, and I was like, this is just like the dumbest thing ever. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, if you don't want to deal with this, come to the Kingdom Summit. Because you know me, I'm a marketer. And so. Oh, <laughs> dude, I love you. <laughs> I, I love you, bro. So I was like, come to the Kingdom Summit if uh, you don't vibe with this, right? right. And. Um, I actually had one of the speakers tell me, like, hey, dude, like, uh, you know, can you take that down? Um, and I did. And I just took out the Kingdom Summit part of it. And I just, you know, I still made the post, but yeah. I took out the promotion. And it did make me think, I was like, you know what? Just because I'm willing to be however I am, you know, that doesn't mean every speaker is or even has the same opinion as me by the way. Mm -hmm. And so I probably shouldn't lump them into my own opinion about like something that is definitely controversial. So I did learn a lesson from that, but it did make me think, I was like, wow, like, so you don't have freedom, you know, because he was getting pushback and it was just like, mm. I don't know, for me, I don't need freaking anybody telling me what I can and can't say. If you're an individual who loves my perspective on things happening in the world, particularly through a spiritual perspective, but you're not able to easily get a hold of me in the comments on YouTube or on Instagram or other social media profiles, trust me, I also feel very frustrated about that. I try my best to respond to all of them as quickly as possible, but with the amount that comes through, it becomes very challenging. But I have an option for you. If you're very serious about getting my expert advice on anything related to entrepreneurship, relationships, social media, current events, or even anything spiritual at all, I've just created a profile on an app called Minect, and this will allow you to connect with me via text message or video message or even schedule a video call, and I can respond to you in as little as 24 hours. So my invitation to you is to go to Minect.com or download the Minect app to your phone. Search my name, it's pretty easy to find, Cap Chatfield, K-A-P-C-H-A-T-F-I-E-L-D, and feel free to ask me any question. I would love to be able to answer that question for you as soon as possible. So please do that today. You can download the app from any app store or you can click the link in the description of this episode or this video to ask me any question on my neck today. Now back to the episode. Do you think he was the right move to change it after he made that comment? I do. I, I actually do. I think out of respect for, like I said, it's okay for me to, to go bear my cross and do whatever I want to do, mm -hmm. but it's not fair to, you know, 10 other people who are going to be associated with my message now. But it's your event. It is my event. Look, right or wrong, 
the, I, the event's going to sell no matter what. Yeah. It's not like it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. I hope you know I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical, but I, I am curious because, you know, I didn't see that post, but I, <laughs> I like, I like, I did a similar post as well. And I think like, for me, my, my whole thing about taking that media from the devil and revealing the glory of God on every long screen is because the media right now, it's a, it's a war zone mm -hmm. for truth. It's a war zone for narratives and, and for Christians, it's like, man, our whole, our whole faith is about a narrative. Our whole commit, our whole commission is about taking this story into all the world and telling people about the good news. And, and so I look, honestly, it's interesting because it's like being a minister and in media it's, and you know, I'm like, Lord, please keep my heart pure in how I approach this. But I'm like, man, the world keeps getting crazier. It makes my job a lot more fun. <laughs> there's a lot to cover. There's a lot to cover. There really is. It's like, there's always something new happening, but, um, I, re I respect you, man. I don't want you to think I, I don't respect you for, for that. But I think the, the concern that I have is we were talking about soft men in, in our previous recording today uh, on your show. And I think like a little bit of compromise, a little bit of, um, yeah, you know, like we'll let that one slide. We won't talk about that. If that thing makes people upset, then we won't go there. And I get it. If you, if you look back in hindsight and you thought, man, I said the truth, but I didn't say it with grace. I said the truth, but I didn't say it in a way that was humble. I said the truth, but I wasn't considerate. I get that. Yeah. But, um, but I think personally, that, that there's a slippery slope when it comes to people saying, especially in the church, like, Hey man, like just preach one message. Yeah. But that message should contextualize itself into like every other area. Why does, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Yeah. And I think a lot of churches struggle with that because, you know, for example, right. To go back to, let's just talk about the whole Tony thing. Right. If somebody was really passionate about, um, you know, this being important, it's like, bro, this is like a really important thing. We got to talk about this. So it's like with Wealthy Kingdom, for example, we don't subscribe to any denomination, right? So I don't care if we have Protestants, Catholics, you know, Pentecostals, Baptists, it doesn't matter to me. But yeah, at the end of the day, we're still going to talk about spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about, you know, the Trinity. We're going to talk about the main things being the main things. And cool, you know, good. like I'm, I'm trying to bring unity into the body. Amen, bro. Yeah. And that happens through conversation. I, for, the reason why I love what you're doing, man, is if you just get people in the word together and you have these healthy conversations, like Holy Spirit will win out. He, he just does. Yeah. If you have a heart of humility, I want to ask you, I want to take a hard right come. Do you have any enemies for your business? I think there's a lot of enemies. Yeah. You don't have to call them up. <laughs> but um, tell me more. Um, I, I mean, like, I think every business is going to have competition. Every business is going to have, you know, competitions, quote unquote, an enemy. Yep. Uh, I think there are people become enemies over time, whether they uh, used to work for you and now they no longer do. Uh, people who are unhappy, you know, there's lots of enemies there. It can be an unhappy customer who becomes an enemy. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's just kind of part of life. So as a Christian, how do you deal with that? Because I think for, for a lot of Christians, we, um, I don't know about you, but just observing Christianity culturally, it's like, you know, don't speak up too loud. Just go to church. Just mind your own business. You know, there's like, and don't ruffle feathers. But here you are. You're successful. You got a beautiful wife. You got a beautiful family. Uh, God's using you in mighty ways. And you're talking about what you want to talk about and you're turning over some tables and, and kicking over some golden calves in the culture. And that's going to, that is going to get a rile out of people, yeah. right? Even people that might work for you. So I think it's naive to say that you stepping in and fighting a culture war, not the same way that the culture is, but from a kingdom perspective, it's going to bring enemies. But how do you deal with that while still trying to maintain the <laughs> witness? Um, I don't know. It's kind of, like I said, I think my mindset from sports and baseball and stuff always made me very uh, competitive and just understanding there's a winner, there's a loser. And you're trying to go freaking beat the crap out of whoever it is you're fighting, mm -hmm. you know? 
And I think also too, and just as I, as I grow in faith and as I start being more obedient to God, I start to like actually see and feel a lot of like, I don't want to say sorrow, but when I see hurt people, that's why they're speaking and, and doing the things that they're doing because they're just hurt, and, you know, and I've seen it time and time again, you know, and, and a lot of times people can get hurt from like, maybe I did truly mess up and they, they have not been able to forgive me and like they're hurt and like, there's not really anything that can be done. It, it's up to them to forgive. Yeah. Um, and then there's times where they screwed up and, you know, they're no longer here and they're hurt because they think that, you know, maybe they don't want to take accountability for their actions. Right. Um, I think there's times where there's just truly people who have animosity and jealousy and envy and things that you've never even talked to them or dealt with them. And yet they, you know, they act the way they act. And so I think for me, from a perspective of growing, you know, trying to become more like Jesus and start to recognize those things of why people are acting the way they're acting. And it makes you respond in a different way, more so with love and compassion than like, oh, I'm about to rip this person. Sure. Because there's plenty of times like, you know, people are talking crazy and like, I got receipts and I could go put them on blast and oh, really let the truth be known. But I just don't even acknowledge it. Wow. You know, it's just like, and honestly, too, and I don't want to like seem like this righteous guy, but in some cases, like, dude, I got to really pray for that person because, man, they're going through it. It takes a lot of maturity to be able to to operate that way when the spotlight's on you, the crosshairs are on you. But but here's the thing. It's in my eyes, it's not because I look at how much God has blessed me. Yeah. And I look at my situation. Yeah. There are times where it's really rough, like I was talking about. Right. And there are times when it's really good. And I just look at the overall just situation that God has given me. And I'm like, wow, my life is really good. Like, I'm really going to go and just get mad at this person who's clearly going through something right now. Like, how is that helping the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And like, it's just more of being grateful for what I have. I want to, I want to think about the person who's listening to this and they're looking at you and they're just impressed. Because you seem to be checking all the boxes. And and I know you'd, you'd say, like, you got so much room to grow, but there's, God's hand is clearly on what you're doing. Business, family, fitness, uh, you know, now media, spirituality, the whole thing. I want to I want to talk a little bit more about what we were talking on the other episode about fear. People are people are not taking shots downfield. People are settling for less. People are looking for uh, an employer or even the government for the crying loud to provide for them. And they're not willing to go take a stand in the culture, take a stand in the marketplace, go build something. What do you think is um, what do you think is the root of holding why people hold back? Well, I mean, like you said, with fear, um, is it Second Timothy 317, I think? Uh, maybe not 17, but you know, God gave us a didn't give us a spirit of fear. Second Timothy one seven. For the one seven. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Second Timothy one seven. Uh, then I gave us a sound mind, dude. Yeah, it was a spirit of fear. So we know that anytime we have fear, it's not for God. It's like, and so, yeah, you know, I'm not trying to have that. You know, the opposite of fear is faith. And so we were just talking about in the other episode that like true, genuine faith comes from confidence in what's unseen, mm -hmm. right, and what's to come. So that's what Hebrews 11 one says. Most people's confidence comes from either the past or the present. And so their confidence is, oh, man, like, look at all these amazing things I did in my past and my track record. I'm going to be great going forward. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, at the end of the day, that is a great way to have confidence. Um, you know, if you're only confident in your present situation, so it's like if things are rolling, I'm good. If things are not good, I'm not good. You know, like, well, then you're a roller coaster type person. But... As a believer, if we believe what the Bible says, we should have confidence in what's to come, right? right? Because this is as bad as it's going to get. Sure. Right? Things are only going to get up from here in the long term of it. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And doesn't mean we'll all go through valleys and stuff on the way to that, you know, 
in place. But I just truly believe that. Like, I just believe that, hey, everything's for my good. So that means whether I'm in the valley or whether I'm in the mountain, it's always for my good. And as long as I'm being obedient to God and doing what he's calling me to do, whatever happens, happens like that. I'm making the right decision. I don't, I don't focus on the results of a decision. I just focus on the process of, is this what God's told me to do? It is whatever, let the chips fall where they may. I want to ask you, um, in, in regards to the way that the economy is going, the market's going, the culture's going, I feel like, I, I mean, to me, it's so evident that we're in the middle of a culture war and it's not just a culture war. It's really a spiritual, war, right? Like that's really what's happening is you said you have the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, which has been fighting each other since the beginning of time. It's now starting to actually materialize in a very public way, particularly in the Western world, in the physical. And that's why we see so much division in the culture. That's why there's, we see all the craziness that we see. How do you think? A, a kingdom entrepreneur plays into God's plan to prepare the way bef before Jesus comes back in the midst of this okay. crazy culture. So this is what I like talking about. So you asked me like, what were some of the other things earlier about what's happened since I was baptized by the spirit? And so yeah. one key thing yeah. that happened was I started to recognize when other people were using their gifts. And so I started to recognize when people were speaking prophetic things into my life. So when, you know, certain situations were happening and when I needed to go, you know, like I just felt the spirit calling me to pray for somebody or do something. Like I started to just become more spiritually sensitive. And so at one of my events, um, this was maybe a year and a half ago, one of the people comes up with a pictures with me and she goes, Hey, Ryan, um, I have a question for you. So as a you know, Christian who's in business or everything else, like I really look up to you. Like I admire what you're doing, how full you are, how you run your business and what you're doing. And I have a question. Who do you look up to? And I sat there and thought about it. And I was like, huh, good. And I thought about like, was, the question was like, what Christian business that not just Jesus, not just into a full Christian, not a pastor. Yep. And I was like, honestly, I cannot think of anyone that I look up to. Wow. And that was my honest answer. I was like, there's, there's great Christian businessmen that people don't know about, right? They don't, they don't have um, media influence. Sure. Right. Uh, like I super respect what Chick-fil-A has been able to do and Hobby Lobby and those guys. It's amazing. But you saw them on the street, like, you, you wouldn't know, right? You're not following those guys. Um, and so I was just like, man, I, I don't know. Like, you know, these old school guys like John Maxwell or Dave Ramsey and stuff, they're great, but like, I don't like look up to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not like in my generation. And Dave and I have very different beliefs about, you know, building a business and sharing things, right? So it really made me think. And I was like, honestly, I don't, I don't, I can't think of any. And then it was like, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, exactly. If not you, then who? Wow. And that really struck with me because I was like, holy crap. I mean, this is like way bigger than, I, than I'm even thinking. Come on. Because I'm like, if they're looking to me for this, then I don't think that there's anyone else like that I'm looking to. I'm like, then I have to do this even better. Yep. And so it was like that process of like accepting what God had appointed me to do and realizing like, no, I've chosen you to do this. So you're it, <laughs> like do it, you know, who else? And then I started to just think about the resources and I was like, who else can throw a thousand plus person events every quarter and have all these resources and, and influence and re relationships to get these people here, you know, who else? is willing to talk about this stuff on a show and a podcast in the business space. Who else could go talk to all these other business influencers that have relationships with them who don't know Jesus and have an impact on their lives. And I was just like, there's no one like I'm going to have to do it, man. And it's funny, man, because I think when you get a big assignment, you don't want to think like, you're like, there's no way that I'm the guy who has to do this. 
right? And I think all the people in the Bible felt that way. Mm -hmm. I think Moses felt that way. I think Joseph felt that way. I think maybe Peter's the only one who didn't feel that way. <laughs> Peter's like, no, I'm the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He didn't have a confidence issue. Yeah, true. But, but it also helped him. It did. And, but I think most of them were like, wait, you want me to go do that? And I really, at the end of the day, like not to sound like, dude, like you're the guy. But I felt like God saying, if you're not the guy, point out who the guy is. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know. And so that led me down this whole new path of saying, okay, you know what? It's not enough to just say, hey, guys, you should go to church on Sunday. Okay? Because they're not, they're not going to meet these people. They're not going to build relationships. He was like, you need to bring the gospel to the marketplace. Come on, You need bro. to meet them where they are. And I was like, hey, we're going to have to, like, change everything. Mm. And I was like, we're going to have to, like, have a worship service at this event. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to be very picky with getting some real strong gospel teachers at my events and, and sew them into the event, right? Because I will have a guy cussing somebody out. You know? I've been there. Yeah, I've, I've been there. <laughs> you know, on stage. It's an interesting cast of characters sometimes. You feel like, wait a minute, this guy's here and then you've got this pastor and then- At Caesar's Palace of all places. Yeah, and then we're on the strip and you know, they're going, but I'm like, dude, we're just meeting people where they are. Right. So good, dude. And the same thing with Wealthy Kingdom, like these Bible studies, they're in people's offices. Yeah. And, you know, like, let's meet them where they are. Yeah. And let's meet if they're if they're already on my show because they want to learn about building wealth. I'm going to still teach them how to build wealth, but I'm also going to meet them where they are and share the gospel with with them and sow seeds. We don't have to make the whole episode about it. Right. But they're going to at least hear there, there'll be a seed there. Yeah. So I want to ask you, do you have any stories, man? I'm thinking of some of the people that I saw at the at recent wealth cons, non-believers, clearly, <laughs> clearly in a different realm. <laughs> you saw them after. after yeah. The <laughs> yeah. Great, great people, though. But um, have you had any uh, wild encounters, particularly with people of, of uh, great influence, whether they're building a business or they're in the me in media, whatever, who came in into a relationship with you, wanting nothing to do with the God part of what you do? But then after encountering you, how you do things, we're like, tell me more about this. Mm -hmm. Have you had any situations like that? I mean, many in, you know, this office alone with just my employees we've had. Yeah. And I think like six or seven employees get baptized in the last year and a half. Come on. That's amazing. Yeah. And just like that, uh, we've had students, we've had attendees, uh, speaker, like very influential people now starting to really look at faith uh, interesting you know some of my friends uh are now like they have influence in their own events so like dude you know what i'm gonna hold a worship service at my event now wow as i see that it's possible and like so it's just like it's setting off these chain of events and different things um yeah like a funny guy brad lee right like brad's always talking you know just crazy stuff prime but like to see his journey the last two years when we first started talking to where it is now, you know, it's, it's cool to see. And that he's not the only one. There's lots of conversations behind the scenes, but um, yeah, dude, it, it's wild. And it's just really, like I said, it's just getting started. Yeah. And even though I do agree with you, like there's this media war and there's this culture war and everything else. I also see the other side of it where I see people being open. Yeah. The idea for sure. Because, they, they understand there's a problem too. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And that's why I think what you do, and this is what I'm trying to get to is like, what you're doing by taking a stand, planting a flag in the ground, building something. I think people, I think Christians, unfortunately, we minimize how important it is to actually build something meaningful because that gives you credibility. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, obviously it's about pointing people to God, but it's like people why would people take our faith seriously if our faith doesn't materialize into something of value? You're always going to be judged by your fruit. 100%. That's what God, God specifically says. You want to know if somebody's a real prophet, judge them by their fruit. Right. He calls us to do that. Yes. And we think there's a problem with it. Right. And yeah. That's a good point. What's interesting is um, I had a guy on my show. His name's Taylor Welch. He spoke at my last Love week. that guy. 
great Christian brother. Uh, he sings worship. I wish I could sing. I'm actually taking singing lessons right now. April, I try to become a triple threat. No, I, that, it, it started with uh, Brian DeMilla, one of my partners. Uh, oh, for your birthday. Yeah. Your birthday. I remember that. Yeah, he bought me singing lessons for my birthday. So I've been doing them. And I'm like, I'm actually not like so awful as I thought. But anyways, this is all part of a good story about imposter syndrome. Because you would think, you're like, bro, really? You have imposter syndrome? And I'm like, yes. Like, I don't think I'm fit to like lead this movement of Christian entrepreneurs. You know, because it's a massive Massive movement. You know, Billy Graham said the next great revival is in the marketplace. Right. Did he say that? Yes. What a G. So know that. He, he's the one saying that this is where it's going to be. Come on. And I believe it, right? And I think we're seeing that. But what was interesting about Taylor was the first day I had him on the podcast, this was maybe like seven, eight months ago. He was like, bro. And this was all like Steve Weatherford and him. And like, it was just the consecutive things that I didn't mean, I had um, Sean Bowles, if you know him, yep. gave me a prophetic word when we, we were in LA. And basically they were all confirming the same word, right? And Taylor goes, I need you to read this book. It's called, um, it's about David. And he said, and he perceived that he was king. And I was like, okay, whatever. Mm. So I, I shrote it down as one of the many books that whenever I get a recommendation, I just buy it. And whenever I get to it, I get to it. Yep. So anyways, I didn't read it for a while. And then this was in January, right after that wealth call, which like was very spiritually like heavy. And a good way or a bad way? A good way. way. Okay. Yeah. I was like, that was crazy. Like just what was happening. Yeah. We had like 400 people in the room get up during the altar call. You were 400. Yeah. I was, was in my, I was sick in my room. Yeah. Dude, for the worship service, we have 400 people. Cause I, and wow. I was like, Hey, if any of you guys want to give your life to Christ, if any of you want prayer, if any of you want to rededicate, just come up, do half the riddle came what up. What on earth? It was crazy. So you know, first worship service at a wealth con? Um, I did one the previous one. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, um, I get done with that event. I'm like, dude, this is like, that was so crazy. Yep. And Taylor texted me. He's like, bro, did you read the book yet? And I was like, now I haven't read the book yet. And then like all these other things started to happen where it was like, basically dude you're gonna have to like really walk into your blank thing and what you're supposed to do and i was like okay and long story short i i had this i was i woke up in the middle of the night this is right right after wealth one and i just was like and i'll wake up like this and i was like man dude god okay if you really want me to do this give me a sign mm. and this is the first time in my life i ever asked god for a sign i'd never asked him for a sign like in terms of do it like i'm usually like oh i feel like doing this let's do it yeah you can't tell I'm like uh i just go you just go but i was like god dude there's a, like a lot of things happening like this seems like it's way bigger than what i'm thinking yeah because my wife um started to get visions too so she got baptized by the spirit a couple of months ago and so this year yeah and she's like i saw you know, these things like we were on stage together speaking in front of like, not not like a wealth con, but like a stadium. Jesus. And I almost started speaking in tongues right now. <laughs> and I was like, that's crazy. And then other people like kept confirmed. So I was like, God, like, I don't know what you want me to do, but if this is it, like, just, you know, give me a side. And I fall back to sleep and I have this dream. Never dreamed like visions or anything like that. And I had this dream of like the sky and the light coming out in the sky. And God was speaking and said, essentially, like, it's all true. Just do it. And that was it. And I woke up and I was like, holy crap. Like, what else do I want? Mm. And I woke up. It was like five in the morning. I was like, I'm just getting up. I can't go to sleep after that. And so I walk over to make a coffee and I look at my Kindle and I don't even know why I looked at it. But I was like, I wonder what the last book I read was. So I took my Kindle on and then I see that book Taylor had reckoned in. Was, so by the way, I had read a book in like five months. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, huh. Well, he perceived that he was king. So I started reading this book and it was all about essentially David's imposter syndrome. Really? And which is what I was going through. And basically... 
and he perceived as king is it's a Bible verse. It happens when they tell David he's already ruined or um, uh, running Judea. Yeah. He's not the king over all of Israel yet. But they tell him they're like, hey, Saul's dead and you're the king. Yep. And David was like, and it was like, and he perceived that he's king. Like he finally like had accepted that. He rested him as a ship. Yeah. It was here. Yep. And it was interesting because at that point, David's like, I think in his mid thirties, I'm in my mid thirties. Um, wow. And not here to say I'm King David, but like they were just talking about his life and all the skills and things God had given him throughout his life to prepare him to become the king. And he was like, you know, he's this little boy and saw, and, and dude, he was anointed king from a young age. Yeah. But it took like 30 years to materialize. So think about David's life. This dude is told he's going to be king and he could have rushed it and said, dude, I'm going to be the king. Like, right, dude, let's go. Mm. Right. And you just look at his life and how God used it. And, you know, he's the least of his brothers. Um, he's the little shepherd boy. While he's the shepherd boy, he learns how to fight lions and bears and protect the sheep. Yep. This dude turns into a savage warrior out in the field. Right. Then, you know, he, he goes to um, he, he somehow becomes uh, Saul's, you know, harp harp guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he plays music for him. And the only reason that he became Saul's harp guy is because they were like, hey, you should meet this guy, David. Like, he's a skilled um, shepherd. He, he can fight bears. He plays the music. He plays music at a high level. He's handsome. He does all these things. You'll like him, Saul. And it was like, what a perfect mentorship. God or J uh, David got to see what being the king was like. He got mentored by the king for years. Wow. Being this guy, right? Like, imagine. You're, you're going to be the president and you get to be just there, like learning as a young boy. People don't think about this. Like he was all preparing. And so then when David goes to fight Goliath, you think about this story too. They should have never let David fight Goliath because all of Israel, he was fighting for all of Israel. It wasn't just his life. They would all become slaves if he lost. Right. Right. And so you, like he goes to Saul. It says, I'll fight him. You can't just walk up to the king as a young kid and be like, I'm going to go fight this guy for the entire country. Mm -hmm. The only reason he could was because of those years spent with Saul and the relationship he built mm -hmm. and for Saul to trust him and say, OK, actually. I think this kid could do it and no one else is willing to step up. So, like, let's let him have at it. Right. So then he goes, kills Goliath. He's famous at this point. Everyone knows who he is. And he got paid to kill Goliath, too with Saul's um, daughter. Yeah. Right. And no taxes. Yeah. No taxes gets paid. And like, you know, so he's a savage businessman too. He's like, wait, so what's the reward again? Yeah. And his daughter, yeah. I've got to pay taxes. Motivated by a reward. Yeah. I he's like, that. I'll go do it. So he goes and kills uh, Goliath. Right now he's famous. So now he's going and leading armies. So he knows how to lead the army. And then, you know, people are like, dude, David's the best. Saul only kills you know, I was in tens of thousands of eight. Yeah. And then Saul banishes, him, mm. right? Tries to kill him. David goes on the run for like 15 years. So you think about it, this dude's life was like on the ultimate trajectory. And then, and then he's banished and he's hunted and his men didn't even want to turn on him during this period of 15 years. And this is where David really develops. He writes Psalms. We, um, is crying out to God as faith is developing. He's uh, dealing with not only Saul trying to kill him, but even his men trying to kill him when they find out like their wives and children were taken. Uh, and so like, in, the, in, in nobody suffered more than David. Joe suffered in a short period of time, but David suffered over the longest extended period of time, really unjustly. And eventually, you know, he lets Saul off the hook a couple of times. He becomes the king in Judea to kind of like prep him for the overall king of Israel. And he finally becomes the king after all this life circumstance. So where, like, why am I telling this story? Because David, despite all those things, despite like God literally telling him certain things mm -hmm. and having such great faith, everyone looks at David. No, no character in the Bible was ever written about more than David besides Jesus. Hmm. Okay. Why does everyone like this guy so much? Why is, why are we called to have a heart like David? Hmm. 
It's because he was always faithful regardless of his circumstance, but he's also like so humble for all these years, even though he knew he was supposed to become the king. He could have accelerated his timeline when Saul was presented to him. All of his, his men were like, bro, kill him. You, you're supposed to be the king. Now's the time. God is telling you now's the time. Kill him. And he's like, no, it's not the time. Wow. And how many of us in business are like, we see the opportunity and we're like, oh yeah, like wow. God told me I'm supposed to make content. And you know, it's like, well, no, not right now, right? How many of us have the discipline to, to withhold because we know that it's not the time God did. But anyways, you know, David becomes king. He kind of like at that point now perceives himself. He's like, okay, now actually is finally the time. After all of this stuff, stuff, now's finally the time. And um, I thought about that with my life a lot. I thought about all the skills and things, you know, I've been through. It's like, bro, you got to play pro sports. You got to make a bunch of money and build businesses and build fame and build wealth. And like, you've also been through the journey of the trials of dealing with hate and people is running on you and all. Like, I just saw all the parallels and I saw that he had told me to keep reading it. And I was like, wow, in like... Now's the time. So that was just this year. Mm-hmm. You know what I think about, bro? I think about uh, Peter, Luke 5, one of my favorite scriptures. Because people think that God isn't interested in business. I don't know. I don't know why people think that business was the devil's idea, but people do. And it's a devil. The devil's idea was to make people think. Oh, totally. <laughs> That's, I, I hear you, bro. But here's what's amazing is so Jesus rolls up on the shore, Peter is fishing. He's been fishing all night long, hasn't caught anything. This is his business. Yeah. Probably a, a trade that he picked from his dad. Been doing it forever. For, yeah, just down his family line, right? Nobody knows how to fish like Peter, especially not Jesus. I mean, Jesus, even though he's the son of God, he wasn't a fisherman. He was a carpenter. But he comes up on the shore and he says, hey, Pete, did you catch anything? And Peter's like, nope, and he didn't catch anything all night long. So Jesus says, why don't you take your boat out to the deep? And cast your net out the side again. It's the middle of the day, by the way, which is not the right time to go fishing. And so Peter's like, I can imagine Peter's like, who the frick does this guy think he is, right? Oh, go fix a table. Yeah, it's like the people in your comments telling you how to build your business. And you're like, who, what? <laughs> Come on now. But Peter had this moment. It was all, I really think it was the Holy Spirit nudging on him. Like, no, this is, this is legit. Like, you should do what he says. And so he says, I've been fishing all night. I haven't caught anything. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to go out to the deep and drop my net. So he gets in the boat, goes out to the deep, casts his net out of the other side. And it says that Jesus basically had set the fish to fill his nets to such a point where they were literally bursting at the seams. And it was that it like the boat was about to capsize. So Peter literally needed to call out to other fishermen to get into his boat to help him with his work. I think about your business. Mm -hmm. I think about how, you know, you had a a little bit of a, you know, a rough time in 2022 onward, but it's undeniable that God's put his hand on what you're doing here. Thinking about how now you can't handle the work on your own. You're having to recruit at church. Yeah, You're going to church to hire people. They're coming in. They're getting to be a part of a godly culture. They get saved, they get baptized, their family, hundreds of generations after them are going to be changed because of that. God has put his hand on your business, just like he did for Peter in this little. Yeah. Peter's nets are filling. Peter comes back to the shore and he is so overcome by the goodness of God that he falls on his face. You think people think that when God blesses your business or you pray that God would bless your business, they think that's an illegal prayer because all of a sudden you'll just like, build a golden calf out of your business or Peter would build a golden fish and begin worshiping the fish, right? But no, Peter comes back to the shore and and falls on his face before Jesus. And he says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It's like the goodness of God brings man to repentance, right? Yeah. Jesus blessed his business. And then what did Jesus say? Jesus said, Peter, don't be afraid. But now, now, see them changing. Now I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And says that Peter left his nets to go follow Jesus. And I see that with you. I mean, I see that God is so clearly blessed, blessed what you're doing. And I don't think you're done with the business thing. I, I, 
personally, I don't think that it's got to be one or the other. Yeah, I think it's you can do both things. But I do clearly see on you there's an urgency. There's a quickening. There's an acceleration. Even the fruit of what you guys have with the Kingdom Summit deal, like the the lab, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Mm -hmm. And I see that changing of the guard. I see God raising you up to go be a minister in the marketplace. And that's why my encouragement is to anybody watching this right now is don't play small. Don't put God in a box. Like you have to fight the religious spirit. You have to fight this religious ideology that God only moves for 90 minutes on a Sunday and then Monday through Saturday. Good luck, buddy. No, good luck, buddy, to the devil. Because when people like you step into the marketplace and say, you know what? We're going to take back Caesar's palace. We're going to take back the strip. We're going to take back a business conference and turn it into an altar of worship. I mean, the devil's shivering when people like you step up and do what you're doing. So I just, I have all the respect in the world for you, man. We only have a few minutes left, but I would love to hear from you real quick. Vision. What's next? What are you trying to do? What is what is God putting on your heart for the next 10 years to build and be a part of? Um, you know, it's it's funny because if you look back five years ago for your life or my life, we would have never envisioned we are where we are. So I think it's kind of foolish to think even five years out of where I'm going to be because I don't know. Sure. Like at the end of the day, I want to make sure I'm just obedient to what he's calling me to do every day. I just kind of live day to day. I don't try to like, you know, the Bible talks about making your own plans and usually don't work out too well when you're just trying to force your way into doing things. And so I'm just like, God, wherever you want to lead it, I'm just going to be obedient and follow and we'll let the chips fall where they may. Um, the only thing I'm certain of is just what Jesus called us to do from the chat. He's like, yo, Go make disciples of all nations. And like, that's the only clear thing that I know I'm supposed to do. Amen. And like, okay, we're going to do that. We're going to go start Bible studies everywhere. And uh, okay, how, now, okay, if, if I know that that is the mission, okay, and how do I get more of these Bible studies started? Okay, well, what do we need? We need more events. We need more resources. We need more influence. We need more marketing. We got to develop more leaders. You know, so like I can now kind of start backtracking from, okay, if the end goal is to make more disciples, right? At the end of the day, we, we said there's too many soft men. There's a lot of men on the earth. They can become unsoft. Yeah. Okay. We <laughs> unsoft. Just, we just get this disciple and we got to harden up. Come on. Iron sharpens iron. So Amen, bro. Amen. I just have to figure out, okay, we have infrastructure now. How do we feed that? Yo. Okay. How do you, I mean, you need money, you need resources. So like all those other things we're doing our business, they're still needed. Right. And so, yeah, I don't think I'll ever stop doing business. And I honestly, I don't think that that's like, I don't, I don't feel God's ever going to call me to like be a traditional pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the reason to that original question of from the person at my event who said, you know, you know, who's it going to be? And God saying basically like, if not you, then who? Come on. It, it, the only reason back to like the analogy of David that I'm able to have the authority to do what I do because I have the Holy Spirit number one, but number two, I also have the track record to lead these people because it's one thing for a pastor to say, Hey, go follow Jesus business people. Right. And they're like, bro, you don't know what it's like running like this. Right. You don't know what it's like having this. And, right. And yeah, I do. Relatability. Yeah. I'm like, no, bro, I do. Oh, you got kids? I do. I know exactly what you're going through. Okay. So let's cut the crap and get to the point. Right. And so I think God has put me in this position of authority on both fronts to be able to do it. Okay. Yeah. Dude, you're a gangster. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on the show today, man. Hey, you guys go follow Ryan Pineda. It's Ryan Pineda on all platforms. Yeah. 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 Go check out his content and uh, look into, if you're looking for a Bible study, Look up Wealthy Kingdom, find a entrepreneur Bible study near you. God bless you guys. I see somebody and he starts speaking in tongues. And I was like, dude, this just got weird. Because like, you came from a Baptist church. Right? Yeah, I, I never experienced that at any church, period. For anybody who wants to, to receive the gift, raise your hand. 
I was just far in the back and I was feeling it and I was praying and I was just like, I'll raise my hand. It felt like from the top of my head, somebody had like poured oil and it just like went over my whole body. Are you serious? Yeah. One of my buddies, he actually works for me. He's worked for me for six years. Strong believer, his name's mm -hmm. Michael. He actually got saved in prison. He goes, dude, I was so resistant and dude, I was like about to walk out and leave, but I felt like God was something like this force was pushing me to the ground to bow down, but there was nobody pushing me. Jesus. So I was seeking like all this help to try and figure out what was happening to me because I could feel things were happening like at a very different level than ever before. You were hungry. Yeah, I was like, I need to understand what's happening right now. Since you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, that there's been a direct correlation to some of the success in your business, particularly with speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. Well, here's the funny thing. Financially, since all that happened, it was actually the worst time of my life. I think that those things were gonna happen whether I was baptized or not. Oh, right? come on now. Because those, those things were already in play. Yeah. I just felt like the spirit leading me. Like a lot of times I don't know why I ended up doing things and then it's not revealed until later. But like, I mean, that was one thing. I've talked a lot about all the transgender stuff. I've talked about men and women's roles and what they should be. <laughs> like, I don't know. I've talked about pretty much everything you can imagine. I just don't care. Well, bro, if you can't say what you want, are you actually free? Taylor goes, I need you to read this book. It's called, um, it's about David. And he said, and he perceived that he was king. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I, I short it down as one of the many books that whenever I get a recommendation, I just buy it. And whenever I get to it, I get to it. Yep. I didn't read it for a while. And then this was in January, right after that wealth call, which like was very spiritually like heavy. And in a good way or a bad way? In a good way. way. Okay. Yeah, I was like, that was crazy. Like just what was happening. Yeah. We had like 400 people in the room get up during the altar call. You were 400? Yeah, I was, in my, I was sick in my room. Yeah, dude, for the worship service, we have 400 people. Dude, half the room came what on earth?